In last week's episode, we talked with Michael Weinberg from Shapeways about 3D printing and copyright. Let's see what you had to say. Made of Magic and Wires on the subreddit brings up a really awesome point and starts a really great conversation about the nature of making a copy when the copy is of something that is not intended to be a physical object in the first place. And is this still in some way copyright infringement? And as I think we will see throughout a lot of the questions that get answered in this comment response, the short answer is yes. Yes, it is, and that this is maybe one of the number one reasons we can look at the copyright regime and say, as one of Michael's papers is titled, this will be awesome if we don't mess it up, that there is a lot of complicated ins and outs, there are a lot of edge cases, and it's kind of all about understanding those edge cases. Um, some of this idea and some of the related territory, um, and also some of the stuff that was brought up by um, Dan Mack and David Schoenheit on um, the Facebook page are um, a thing that Michael and I actually talked about a little bit that didn't end up in the episode. It ended up on the cutting room floor. We had a conversation about a recent kerfuffle slash hoax question mark that happened in Germany as it relates to a bust of Nefertiti that was 3D scanned. We talked about the nature of a copy, whether or not one can have interest or um, can protect a handmade copy versus a scanned copy. So we're gonna package that up, we'll upload it as a private video, we'll put some links here and in the description if you wanna watch it. And I think it gets to some of these questions and is also just in general a really interesting thing that Michael knows a lot about. Out. Loco Dantes, who works in manufacturing, starts a really great conversation that gets into some very interesting um, technical high grass, let's call it. It's not quite weeds, it's just high grass. And it seems like the central conceit here is that every generation, maybe every decade or two, there has to be some sort of moral technological panic that occurs related to uh, the capability that human beings have to copy things. It was Betamax, it was VHS, it was mini discs, it was MP3s, it was tapes, and now it's objects. And I think it's 3D printing. And I think that the reason 3D printing is different is because it's objects. It's a different set of ideas and manufacturing methods than all of those other things which were related to media and not things. And I think that a lot of this conversation and especially some of the things that uh, they get to in this conversation really, really allows us an opportunity to um, uh, consider the differences that we perceive and take for granted between information and media and things, even though they are necessarily sort of somewhat the same. Tommy Hanusa, Nicholas Kindig, and a bunch of other people brought up 40K, which if you aren't familiar is a uh, tabletop war game that relies very heavily on miniatures that has been very much involved in uh, let's say, the conversation surrounding the duplication of objects and the ability for people to print them out because a lot of their business model is based around selling um, very high quality, uh, very detailed miniatures that are not only used to play the game but can be painted and decorated um, in very painstaking ways, make these beautiful little objects. And so this is a huge part of this conversation about what 3D printing can eventually bring to all different corners of culture. and Conceivably, one of them would be printing out miniatures that you use for your pastime, but uh, a lot of the powers that be, of course, are threatened by this because it is an additional avenue for the people who play their games to get the parts needed to play them, um, possibly through, um, you know, uh, less than legitimate means. And I think that really what we'll see in the end, we'll put some links to uh, some really interesting articles uh, that you can read because this is a much larger conversation than we have time for in a comment response. But I think that like what Michael was talking about, it took 10 years for music publishers to realize that the solution to the problem is to just be the best provider of the material and the content that people are after. I like to think that hopefully the same thing will be true for war games and miniatures and all of the related parts that these companies will eventually realize that the best way to solve this problem, got so many quote fingers, I'm about to fly away, um, is to be the best provider. And maybe that means selling 
selling um, models, selling um, object files for people to print out models, having 3D printers in the shops themselves. I've heard of a couple different places that are doing something like this. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm hopeful for the future. And for those of you that know more about 40K and the related games, I'd be curious to know what you see as solutions to this problem and things that are just on the edge of being accepted both by the community and you know the companies that allow everybody to come together and play these awesome games. Shane Tilton and I had a really short conversation on the Idea Channel Facebook about how Walter Benjamin would feel about all of this, especially as it relates to the stuff that Michael was talking about with the arts, that this really brings a crazy challenge to the idea of the original in the art world. And there is some precedent to this where someone like Saul LeWitt, uh, who did a lot of wall drawings, would only allow one wall drawing to be in a single place at a single time, though conceivably it could be anywhere because the piece is really just people following a set of instructions. And so that's how he maintained the scarcity that made his works valuable. When we're talking about 3D printing, you know, what is it? Is it that checksum that Michael was talking about? That there is somehow only one object at a time that is the official object, even though there are actually several different instances of it around the world. So my read on the situation is that Walter Benjamin is probably, I mean, you know, not rolling in his grave because he's been dead a long time. But if that were a thing that happened, so much rolling, there would be so much rolling in the grave. David Schoenheit, this is a great idea, but I just want to point out that I misread this and thought that you were saying that it would be interesting to create a model of the songs that you can buy on iTunes that represents their audio content and then sell it on Shapeways. And then that got me thinking about then rescanning that and trying to turn it back into audio from a physical object. And now I guess there goes my weekend. Benjamin Silver and someone whose username is very complicated, so I'm gonna read it off my phone just in the hopes of getting it even close to correct. Zestriditigliglv, oh boy, asked a question about where um, functional and decorative objects meet. What happens when you have something that can be said to be a uh, decorative version of something that serves a purpose? And this was a question that I asked Michael. I asked him um, how you approach this. And he talked about how there is a degree to which one can separate the decorative aspects from a functional item. And that is very much a judgment call, how much the decoration is in fact functional, how much decoration or function can be split before you know you um, change it into, change the very nature of the object. Um, to, to sort of look into this more, um, the, the legal concept is called severability. So if you wanna go and do some Googling, you can take a look at severability. And this is, this is the sort of legal judgment that goes into whether or not something is protectable by copyright or by patent. And it's whether or not the decoration is severable to some degree from the function. Daniel Boken asks a really interesting question about how 3D printing will impact the construction of automobiles. And this is another question that I asked Michael. Uh, so I'm actually just gonna read his response because I think it's really good. He writes, I don't know that this necessarily raises new issues. Major components of modern engines already exist as CAD files and the method of manufacture, CNC routing versus casting versus 3D printing, generally should not impact their intellectual property status. Major vehicle manufacturers, and this is the part that I find really interesting. And of course, this is the case. I just never thought about it are worried enough about losing this information to a rival so they have pretty strong data security protections in place. Presumably these are robust enough to handle any changes related to mass access to 3D printing. I think one of the reasons that I find this really interesting is that I now have a new idea for a plot in my Shadowrun game where the runners have to go and steal 3D modeled uh, files from a rival company. This is just amazing corporate espionage story waiting to be told. Noche21 asks a question about personal use and whether or not one is still infringing when they make a copy of a functional object that is just going to be used 
in their home? Uh, and this is the another question that I asked Michael and his response was basically, yep, still breaking the law, even though it is likely that the people who would be upset uh, don't know about it. So this is like, you know, if a tree breaks the speed limit in the woods and there's no police officer with a radar gun there to see it happen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Michael also points out something really interesting, which is that, you know, this is the reason why so many of these corporations go after P um, aggregates, you know, websites that pull together infringing material because they're just, they're highly visible, whereas someone, you know, in their home, printing out something that infringes on a copyright is a thing that they just will never actually know about. I think we're all on the same page here. We would all absolutely, positively, 100%, never, ever hesitate, we would download a car. And last, but certainly not least, buy our merch. Are you or someone you know? a liberal arts unicorn. If so, you can get them or yourself the new Idea Channel t-shirt, which depicts exactly that. The illustration is by friend of the show, Andrea slash Art Sparrow, who did our um, uh, light bulb and butterfly t-shirt. It also includes my personal favorite part, uh, the slogan Omnia Sunt Gravia, which uh, roughly translates from the Latin to all things are interesting, which I like to think is somewhat of the um, the driving force or the central ethos of Idea Channel. Uh, it is a black t-shirt, clearly, with slightly silvery, silver ink, slightly sparkly. Uh, we'll put a link to dftba.com everywhere if you wanna put this on your body.